I'm Philip de Normandy. Uh, my offices are in the Blackstone block, which is adjacent to parcel nine. Uh, they've been there for 30 years. And uh, tonight, uh, obviously, uh, there have been some tremendous changes in what our proposal was a year and a half ago. Uh, and a lot of that is due to the constructive input that the neighborhood and the advisory committee has <coughs> made, especially in allowing one portion of the building to be higher than was originally proposed, thus allowing a large portion of the uh, building to be lower than uh, a lot of the proposals were in the past. What this has done is it's allowed us to have basically uh, the apartments at the North Street end of the property, which are for about one third of the property, and then the other two thirds are a lower portion of the project. Uh, in addition to that, one of the major things you can go to the next slide uh, is I have a background in agriculture. You may not recognize his truly there, but that's me with Governor Christian Herter back in 1953, winning first prize at the Topsfield Fair. Uh, and I've been involved in agriculture ever since. I have a big farm down in Fairhaven. And my interest in this project stems primarily that this is the market district. It's not an industrial site. It's not a necessarily an office site. It's not whatever you want to call it. It's the only area in Boston that is the market district. And our purpose in our proposal is not to dominate the market district, but to complement it. And to further explain how our project integrates into the market district and the Blackstone block, uh, I'd like to introduce Cy Mintz, who's on our architectural term team, and then uh, after he's done, I'd like to have Ed Nardi run through what our programs are and what the building looks like. And then obviously we have lots of members of our team here if you have specific questions. And we look forward to an interesting and vibrant discussion. So thank you very much. Go ahead. My name is uh, Cy Mintz. Many of you I know in the room, some I do not. I've had my office in the Blackstone Block uh, even longer than Phillips been there. I also, some of you know, I'm the architect for the Bostonian Hotel. So I have a great deal of familiarity with the block. In addition to that, I wanted to comment that I'm part of an architectural team that uh, Philip and Ed has put together, UTO, and uh, unfortunately one of our important members couldn't be here uh, uh, tonight. Uh, uh, that's Tim Love because he's in a mayor's conference, but uh, and Phil Peresco is here. So we're a team, we're three architects, uh, and we're, we have uh, actually come up with what we believe is the, uh, the analysis of this block that's critically important, that frankly came out of a great deal of work done by all of you on the advisory committee, with Mass DOT, BRA, uh, and, and that is, 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 is that we see the market district as sort of four very significant pieces, okay? The first piece is, is one of, is the piece we're talking about tonight, which is Parcel 9. One of the wonderful things about Parcel 9, it's the only really new building to be built in the market district. So that's a significant opportunity for us to try to create something that will enrich the other pieces of the block. And the other pieces of the block, those of you know, are Parcel 7, where the public market was designated just uh, a few weeks ago. In addition to that, there's the Blackstone block, where Philip de Normandy owns a great deal of the uh, vacant uh, land and buildings in the block. The other side of Blackstone Street, so that's critically important as, as well. And the other piece, of course, we all know about, which is really how the history of this block has been set. 
which is by the pushcart market, okay? That's what makes this a market area. So by developing each of these pieces and by relating each piece and strengthening each piece, we believe that's the scheme, that's the approach that you've taken, and we've tried to adopt that approach. I think the other thing is, is we've also worked very hard to respond to both the guidelines as well as the spirit of the guidelines. And the guidelines to us were important because we think that having the lower portion of the building, which is what you see here, and essentially with a one-story piece here at the end of Hanover Street, provides the opportunity that I think everybody wanted, which was essentially to look down Hanover Street and have a connection between Hanover Street and the market buildings. We therefore have located in a small portion of the end of the building our residential component, so that in essence, what we're talking about here is essentially a market building. That was the other key piece that the development team wanted to achieve. But when you look at this, it's a market building with a small piece of housing at the end of it. Therefore, it doesn't become a different kind of use with a market on the ground. We thought that was extremely important. In addition to that, We've, in terms of, which Ed will go into in more detail, but what's important is, is the kind of uses that our development team and our developers have insisted upon happening here. This is really a food building. The ground floor, which Ed and Philip will go into more, is essentially all market, except for a small portion where we have our residential entrance. The rest of it is essentially market. The second floor, are all food restaurants. So again, they're food related, okay? And the roof itself is a green roof, which again will be explained by uh, 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 Ed and, and Philip. So I, I think what we're trying to say to you is we see this as the market building that you've asked for. We see the housing as a, as a, a piece of it, but not the dominant piece. Thank you. Thanks, Cy. Um, my name is Ed Nardi. I'm a principal at the Crescent Group here in Boston. Um, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to be part of this team and have the opportunity to explain uh, the program to you tonight. Um, and, and really the purpose is to kind of just take you through the program uh, and make sure that we're uh, understanding exactly what we're proposing here. Um, so, parcel nine. Um, the program uh, is, uh, uh, as Cy has touched on, on the ground floor is a market of approximately 18 to 20,000 feet. Um, we've had discussions with a couple of preliminary markets, again, more boutique driven markets, obviously given the size of the space, uh, but certainly um, uh, it is a viable market and it is, again, uh, here to complement the already existing marketplace. Uh, parcel 7 obviously being designated recently, uh, and that will come into formation uh, as the months go by. Um, uh, the the, the pushcart um, vendors obviously set the pace uh, on Blackstone Street along with the adjacent stores uh, in some of Phillips' properties and other owners of the Blackstone Block. And, um, Obviously, there's a strong relationship to Faneuil Hall, but again, a different type of retailing and market goes on there as well. Um, second floor, uh, three restaurants are initially planned, obviously subject to change in terms of the final venues that go there, um, and each with its own distinct uh, location, access, and viewpoints from the second floor. Um, the roof of the second floor, a green roof, uh, as well as an associated greenhouse. Um, green, I guess green roof here is a simple term we use. It's really meant to be an agricultural center. Um, and I know Philip uh, has had discussions with the Ellie School really to kind of bounce a concept off them in terms of the educational program, middle school driven, um, and uh, trying to get back to appreciating exactly where our food comes from for the children uh, and the school system. Um, as Cy touched on, uh, towards the uh, west end of the site, the apartment block, again, roughly in the same scale and height of the Bostonian Hotel, 
uh, occupying about a third of the site, 10,000 square foot footprint, um, 50 units in total. Uh, the mix of uses uh, was really carefully constructed so that it helps to energize the area as an ongoing marketplace uh, from the morning through the later evening. Um, market 8 to 8, 8 to 10 o'clock at night, restaurants obviously, uh, lunch and probably later into the evening, and of course the residential element uh, in the background uh, being more of a 24-7 element. Um, I think we did take a different approach in regard to the previous proposal. Um, I think uh, when you look at the lower portion of the slide here, um, I think what strikes me is you can really appreciate the kind of the variety of uh, historic buildings, the size, the the uh, heights, um, and certainly the building when it's you know stands out from that is uh, uh, you know. Uh, standalone design, but when it kind of sits back into the context, it really does complement, really does kind of disappear into the fabric, the existing fabric of the neighborhood, and it's really meant to be a, a complement and a good neighbor. The push cart vendors, um, they provide the energy um, and really the, the long history here uh, in terms of uh, the marketplace itself um, through all seasons, um, and certainly uh, we're committed to um, keeping them as they are today uh, in Blackstone Street. Um, we're not here to gentrify their use. We're not here to relocate their use. Uh, we want to complement their use. Um, and um, obviously that, that uh, means that we are willing to you know, commit to uh, working with uh, the, the state, the city, the other stakeholders um, to flatten the street so it's a safer environment for the shoppers and the push cart vendors, provide utilities, electrical, water, lighting, um, so that their setup uh, is, is more conducive to running their business. And most, uh, and very importantly, in this area, providing a, 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 a well-conceived trash recycling center for themselves, as well as our programs in our building, restaurants and market. Um, again, uh, we, we opted for a option, uh, much like uh, Yaki Way has done over the last few years, when they close down Yaki Way for the games and really take over the street. Um, we feel it's important to keep the vendors, the push cart vendors, where they're at today. It's, it's historic. Um, I think it's territorial. They understand how they operate in their spaces today. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, uh, emergency access is critical, and we respect that, but we've had discussions with them on perhaps how we can edge in on either side of that block, again, much like the Occupy does, um, and maybe put some of those push carts on wheels, something that's much more accessible to move in case of an emergency. And again, I guess from 10,000 feet, I'm kind of backing up and just, just simply looking at how uh, the program tries to fit into the larger market district, the Greenway, the North End, up towards the West End, uh, along the surface road, back to Daniel Hall, the transparency of the block, the through traffic, storefronts, visual, um, all important elements in terms of keeping the, the, the primary plane, the primary um, ground floor open and accessible. And then just walking through the basic program of the building itself, uh, three restaurants, three different entry points, allows the restaurants to have appropriate access, theming, uh, up at the east end, uh, up towards the northeast, if you will, and the, and the lower west, each would have their own entry. Um, uh, the apartment lobby is uh, featured off the greenway itself. I think that's a, a, a nice uh, visual back to the north end, as well as um, kind of separating it from the more vibrant marketplace. Um, critical there. Um, the West, and again, the Waste Recycling Center, again, easy access to the uh, push cart vendors. Um, also, uh, kind of this elevator here would have service um, storage for the push cart vendors, access to the kitchens for the restaurants, 
and ultimately lead to the, uh, the green roof as well. And the stair associated with that would also provide stair access. Uh, loading for the uh, residential and the uh, market itself would be off North Street, kind of accommodated by a new uh, cutout along the North Street sidewalk, which is generous. Uh, I think it's a 20 feet in excess of 20 feet. But we want to be uh, mindful of that. We have to get out of that traffic flow. Um, basement uh, dedicated uh, to the pushcart vendors for their storage, access through a uh, secure and, and, and large elevator and stairway. Uh, second level, again broken up into three restaurants conceptually. Uh, average size 68,000, which is kind of the, the, the norm uh, in the Boston area. Um, and again, the kitchens all kind of tie in back to the elevator, back to the waste and recycling area. Uh, taking advantage of its unique, unique location in Boston. Um, the, the restaurants all have uh, decks, exterior decks. Uh, you can see the views uh, back towards the north end, up towards the Zayka Bridge down the Greenway, and back towards Haymarket Blackstone. Um, it's it's a, uh, obviously a unique historic view from all, all spots. Uh, the Urban Agricultural Center and Greenhouse uh, also buffering against Blackstone Street so there's not uh, direct residential access overlooking the Blackstone Block. Uh, critical, I think, in terms of just keeping that separation um, kind of on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. Um, just demonstrating here that the, uh, just being, it's, it's kind of unique positioning in terms of the parcel line itself, running north to south. <laughs> Um, demonstrating through the uh, shadow study that in the growing season it captures um, adequate light for that green roof to be successful um, and a view from let's say the fourth and fifth floor of the residential looking up the greenway. Uh, residential floors four through seven, ten units of floor, um, uh, four units face out to Blackstone Street, um, and again, your standard mix of urban units, studio ones and twos. Um, just, just a bit about Crescent Group. We're, we're a, a really a kind of a Boston-centric uh, developer. Uh, I've been uh, doing development in Boston for 29 years, 12 years at Crescent, which was founded in 2000. Um, by the very nature of our in-town development, most of our projects are mixed use. Um, Castanetti building uh, back in the uh, late 1990s. We're finishing up a Watertown project uh, up, excuse me, uh, up to the uh, right hand side, uh, south end, kind of the, uh, the old Allied Bolt building. Um, and our latest project was actually down in the Seaport District, uh, Liberty Wharf, which um, again um, has given us a lot of experience with multi use, uh, multi facility restaurants, uh, both at the first and second level. Um, full benefit from Blackstone Street, certainly we hope all the stakeholders involved. Uh, the pushcart vendors and the other vendors in the area, uh, obviously local youth and schools from the, uh, the agricultural center as well as visitors. Uh, vendors and restaurant tours, our experiences, the more the better, the better the synergy. Um, certainly our restaurant space is far different than a lot of restaurant space both in the north end and in Daniel Hall, so it provides different venues for different uses, not necessarily competing uses, local residents, visitors, and tourists alike. Um, we took our best guess at a timeline. Um, uh, we, we think that there's, uh, you know, the devil is in the details. Um, there's a lot of things to be worked out, um, uh, but we think we, are, we can move through that coordination of the Article 80, working with the state, uh, there are reviews by the state um, at each step of the way of the development of the plans and then eventually um, uh, the construction, 14 months, uh, and then the build outs. So from today to completion, I would say it would be maybe realistically three years. If things move a little quicker on the front end, we can shorten that, but um, we're, we're certainly ready to go. Thank you. Thanks. Emilio, can you hit the light switch there, please?
I'm going to start with the committee. I'm going to start on this end, um, Ryan. Yep. Um, thank you for your presentation. My, my first uh, question, I have two questions. Actually. My first one is, uh, with 50 new units going in, um, what, uh, if anything, are you guys doing for parking in those residences? Um, you know, we, we, there is no parking. I mean, obviously, the site is somewhat compromised by the tunnels underneath it, which I think uh, occupy about 60% of the 29,000 foot site. Um, but it's, it's really been our experience downtown. I'll give you an example. Um, one of the slides up there was a, uh, a, piece, uh, a, a piece of real estate we bought down off the Greenway in the Leather District, uh, touching the Greenway. Uh, and uh, it was Lincoln Plaza, where Honeyman Real Estate used to be, about 220,000 feet, of which we developed uh, 92 units of housing in about 130,000 feet. We had one parking spot. Um, and these were condominiums, not for rent. These are limited to rental units. Um, you know, those all sold out. They were all mid-price point units. Um, we lost one sale because we didn't have parking um, in our sell out of those. Um, so I think, really, uh, our experiences, parking ratios are, are, are lower in rental than condominium. Um, and the data we have is it's about a, uh, if you had parking, it would be about a 0.3, 0.35. Um, here, given the size, 50 units, the units are, um, again, urban units, studios 500 feet, one bedroom 700, two bedrooms 900 to 1,000 square feet. Um, we think that the, uh, the parking would be relatively inconsequential. And I can appreciate parking is tight everywhere in Boston, but, uh, you know, if we could build parking, we'd probably be building 10 or 15 spaces at the end of the day. Well, that actually leads me to my next question. I know when the Archstone building by the garden first opened up, they were having a lot of trouble um, filling the residences there. What studies, if any, have you guys done to um, to see that there's an actual need for additional residences? In well, I, 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 I think it's I think it's uh, probably fair to say uh, Boston's a uh, a high barrier to entry in terms of constructing new projects. Um, uh, and it, I, I guess it's driven by two things, experience and, and market knowledge. Um, uh, we've done about 10 projects in Boston that are residential in nature, um, some rental, some condominium. Um, and again, we play to the mid-market. We're not building 1,500 square foot units. We don't, we don't build the, you know, low income units. We build units that are, again, uh, kind of in the, in the middle placement um, and we've had no problem selling through or renting up. Um, on the rental side we rent 10 to 20 units a month uh, when we have a rental product. Um, by way of, um, and uh, so we're currently doing another rental project in the city. We have a fair amount of data. Um, I would say the absorption would be more than that today um, given that there's a fair amount of pent up demand given the, you know, kind of the recessionary times we're coming through. Um, and uh, as a data point, though, off the Greenway, um, Russia Wharf um, uh, that Boston Properties redeveloped, they have, I think it's 70 to 80 units in there. Uh, they rented up quite quickly. Um, uh, and uh, I know that the, uh, the market was quite healthy in terms of the absorption. I think they leased up in about three months. Thank you. Danny? Yeah, I want to commend the team on what seems to be a very exciting proposal. I have a couple of questions about the restaurant space. I yep. love the idea of the energy and 18 hour a day type of use. Um, there seems to be a, a terrace associated with each restaurant. Do you envision that to be an extension of the seating capacity as opposed to a roof dining venue? If not, then it become a very attractive place for young people. And I think there's been, you know, some concerns with, you know, Entertainment spaces and late night noise. That's a that's a fair question. No, I think I think it's um, I, I think really the experience is going to be uh, again much like Liberty Wharf, where the the outdoor dining is an extension of the restaurant, um, and it's seasonal. Um, we don't, you know, uh, you know that's what makes it uh, mm -hmm. successful. You're you're actually outside. You appreciate the views. It's unencumbered. Um, so we we think it's. It's outdoor dining. Um, it's not an extension of perhaps the bar nightclub spilling out to the outdoor terrace. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I have a couple of things. First of all, I'd just like to say I'm delighted to see 
project responding so explicitly to the market district uh, references that were made in, in our guidelines because I think it, it's, it's very clear that this is seen as part of the district and I think that, that's, uh, that's clear and, and a good thing. I also like very much that, there, that the identity of this building seems to be the market. I mean, it has the housing block on it, uh, but clearly uh, the identity is the market. I also think it's a very uh, nice idea to have the sort of bay system that you're talking about that would lend itself very easily to the kind of uses for the market that are envisioned. So I mean, all of that seems really, I think, quite coherent. Um, you know, since uh, I have a chance to ask a question before Otto, I think I'll, I'll, I'll ask <laughs> I'm going to point it to Pete. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd just ask about the arrangement of the push cards. Yeah. And, and, and um, I, am I correct in noting that in, in contrast with the previous proposal, you're showing the push cards aligned against the uh, current Blackstone Street stores that they connect to um, and leaving the more open space between the push carts and parcel nine. Am I am I reading that correctly? Yeah, no, I, th I, I think what we're trying to do is really respect the existing fabric as it is today, if you will. <coughs> uh, as I understand it, I certainly could be wrong. Uh, you know, the first line is really where, you know, Puritan beef and those, you know, the, the shops are and the physical entity of the Blackstone block. Um, as I think one of the gentlemen said, they, they really do have a symbiotic relationship with the push carts that are the next line. Um, that are there, and then you've got this this you know third line. Although it's uh, uh, you know um, there's a lot of action on that back side in terms of the, the moving of the, the product and the, and the trash removal on an ongoing basis. But I think that's right. I think our, our preference would be to try to keep that intact. Um, again, I can I in, in discussions, and I can appreciate that you can if you've been there for a long time and you've been successful there. Well, moving a block down might not seem like a big move. But it's there's a lot of uncertainty, and I and we certainly respect that we'd like to keep it there. I, one one final point I think it is in, this isn't really an architectural point. It's a it's a, um, it's a it's a management point, and that is that with your team having um, the owner of many of those properties as the partner, I mean I think this makes it infinitely likelier that a symbiotic relationship between the push cart situation. The Blackstone Block, um, you know, the investment in which we have isn't really explicitly being discussed here, but it's, I think for all of us, I, I hope, uh, uh, what would be a positive outcome of this of, of the development of Parcel Nine. So that seems likely in this scenario. Thank you. Yeah, that's good for me. To follow up on that, can you put up page 11 for me around? Sure. And what I see is I see the push cards out on the third row, and. The west end entry is about 100, 100 feet, oh. no push cards. Right there? Is that the one on No, it? page oh. 11. Uh, I think it's, it's entitled ground level. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Great. There you go. There you go. Yep. And it's hard to see from that picture, but when I look at it on far left, far right, it shows about 100. And maybe, Sai, you can tell me a little bit more about this. It shows the cart's not being there in the third row. Can you tell me what you plan on doing with those cots? No, we, because that discussion came up with you uh, in the meeting we had a few days ago. The thought there was, that the reason we, at the time that we drew this, Otto, there wasn't the thought about movable carts. So the answer to that is, I mean, this is subject to dealing with the city, and BTD, things that you already know. Okay. okay, but what we would like to be able to do is to continue the carts both here and, and here, but in order to be able to have some penetration for emergency vehicles, which is in contrast to the other alternative of a 20-foot emergency going down the whole middle, if these were in fact on, on, on wheels that could be quickly moved out of the way, it allows you, and that was seemed to be acceptable to you, and that's what we anticipated, but that admittedly that was after we heard that from you. We didn't know that when we drew this. I just when when you look at it physically, it's a little scary to someone like Henry who just saw it, you know? I, I just wanted a better clar clarification from I hope I clarified that yeah. for you. And now, Philip, can you tell us about the uh, the market itself? What's gonna happen within the market? Yeah. The 
Uh, basically, there are uh, lots of different levels in farming. Uh, there are uh, very small farmers, medium-sized farmers, and large farmers, just to make it simple. Uh, the large farmers basically sell their produce at their own stands. Uh, they have no need for a market in Boston. Uh, they basically take care of themselves. The middle-sized people uh, sometimes go to 25 or 30 uh, farmers markets every, <coughs> every week. They have trucks, they have whole staffs, they're quite well established, but they may be located where farmland is cheaper and the demand for their product is less, so they end up basically selling their product through uh, farmers markets. Then there are a lot of smaller farmers or farmers who uh, don't really have a, a viable market for their product. That's sort of the market that I fall into. I have basically 30, 40 steers a year that I slaughter. Our idea is that this market would basically be a cooperative type style market where it would be professionally managed and farmers could sell into this market and uh, not have to be there. They obviously would get the premium on their product, but they also would get uh, the bottom of the market which sells uh, wholesale. It leaves them in a market where they can make a living and that's sort of the concept. Uh, we've worked with Farm Credit for this, they've done a lot of studies for us on this, and they feel that it's very viable. And so it basically allows the market district to said, stand on uh, sort of four feet. One would be the push carts, which have a very definite market, the New Boston uh, market, which uh, has its very definite market. Then the uh, west side of Blackstone Street, which has its definite market, and this, which would also have its same market. And they all complement each other. And I can go and we could spend hours discussing this, but it's basically, they all sort of fit together. And uh, they have to understand each other and work with each other, but that's basically the gist of it. So it's more of a high-end market. Right? Absolutely, it's a, no. yeah. yeah. Not, not, not no, no, it's the push it, it, it's it's the highest of the high, yes. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to go forward in an area opened up by my colleague from the North End, Dan Nuzzo, which is impacts on the North End uh, from noise and, uh, uh, and uh, foot traffic. And, uh, and that, what I want to focus on is the three restaurants on the first floor. Um, well, second floor, second I guess what you call second level, yeah. but it's ground floor? If no, it's second floor. floor. Second floor. Second floor. Second floor. Second floor. Second floor. Second floor. Oh, okay. This, this is a shot of the second floor. Um, on the first floor, or just the, oh, that's ground the, the entry points, if you will. Yes. Okay, thank you. That's yeah. the yeah. um, But in any case, we have on the other side of Blackstone Street, um, uh, Union Street with Irish pubs. Uh, which produce noise and young uh, drinkers. We have at the and some <laughs> especially tonight. <laughs> Just bias. I'm going in the other direction, so I don't. Know. Um, we have the point um, right on the other side of uh, Blackstone Street, uh, which produces uh, drinkers uh, of whatever age and noise. Um, What's your feeling about or thinking about how you can operate, or do you intend to operate, a different kind of uh, restaurants or, or lease out to other operators for a different style of restaurant where you have three of them right next to those others that are uh, perhaps wouldn't be good neighbors if they were in the North End. Um, without the restaurant use, the building might provide a buffer uh, at night. Uh, with restaurant use, how are you going to deal with that problem? Yeah, I think that, that's a fair question, and I think it, you know, is somewhat solved by economics to a degree, and some by use. Um, I, you know, we don't, some of the establishments you mentioned, uh, we certainly can appreciate as energizing the street maybe a little bit later on, um, and, and having some, perhaps from time to time, a conflict, but, um, 
I think this this helps solve itself because I think that the uh, you know we're looking for eating establishments, restaurants, not necessarily fine dining, but that one of them could be a, a more fine dining, not dining establishment. But you know the rent here to make it work, uh, given its unique location, it's a great piece of real estate. Um, it'll it'll command a, a reasonable price point in the marketplace. Uh, the investment is significant. Um, our experience in, at Liberty Wharf is the restaurants invested somewhere between five and six hundred dollars a square foot. Um, you know, uh, if you will, um, uh, the other type of establishments, it's hard to make the numbers work unless it's more of a, a, rest or a restaurant, destination restaurant. Um, so I think that's really the, the, the goal here is to, again, create the diversity in the marketplace. Um, not compete head to head with those type of establishments. That wouldn't be successful for us. It would go against the grain of the residential we're trying to do. Um, and I can tell you the experience we have down at Liberty Wharf is we have we will have five restaurants there, um, all fairly active, and are directly across the street. There's 450 units of residential, and uh, we've never had a complaint yet from the residential that are directly across the street on a much narrower street than obviously the Greenway in terms of the activity uh, down there. Um, <clears throat> well, I guess what I'm thinking is, do you think that with the raucous noise produced by the pub called The Point, which I've heard walking by, sure, uh, I have too. that restaurants of the type you described will want to be there? Yeah, I think they will. I think, uh, you know, not too far up the street from us is, uh, again, down the seaport is, uh, some fine establishments, Whiskey Priest and the Atlantic Beer Garden. And they, they tend to have a little bit of a raucous crowd from time to time. But again, it's it's a generational mix. And it's, uh, again, it, it's what drives the synergy uh, in the city. I don't think we'll have uh, a, a whole lot of heartache filling it with an appropriate um, use. Uh, one, one more question, if I may. Uh, an architectural question. Uh, this one. Uh, as you know, the uh, development guidelines called for maintaining uh, view corridors from the north end, uh, from Henry Street, Salem Street, uh, and Club Street. Uh, I see a bump, what looks like a bump, in that's described as the Urban Agricultural Center. Can you show us a little more about what that urban agricultural center it's bump a, is, it's a glass greenhouse. is going to do to the views from the north end? Well, it's a, it's a greenhouse, so if I put a greenhouse in, in, in here, I would see you and, and, and you would see me. It's just, it's just a small greenhouse, which is essentially all that it is. Okay. I'm sorry, it wasn't transparent. Enough. That is the views of Blackstone Street and the 18th century, 18th and 19th century buildings. Yeah. Will the bump interfere with that? Will the urban agricultural center interfere with the views yeah, of, it, I, of I the mean, old it, buildings? The answer to that is it's transparent. So the reality is, is you see through it, it, it just plants that are there. So the fact is it's a greenhouse. And if you want to go to any greenhouse and stand on one side and I'm on the other side, we certainly see each other. So that's all that, that that is. It also, by the way, helps a little bit, which was another reason. We wanted not just to have one plane of roof, because the Blackstone Street, as you well know, the Blackstone Block has sort of a variegated roof. There are two stories, one story, four story, three stories. So the objective here, again, as, as far as the architectural team was, was to try to pick up some of that, but to do it in a transparent type of building. And that's what we've shown. So the short answer is it won't block the views. That is true. OK. We believe it won't. Yes. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Pick there anything else? Otto, before I skip it. OK, Ted. Okay. Well, uh, simply to emphasize what George said about architecture, which I think is something that architects care about uh, more than anybody else, probably. Uh, but uh, I think it's uh, a fine response uh, in, a, in a design sense uh, to the opportunity. And uh, I have a question, I guess, for Phil, or maybe it's an observation. 
that if, if I were the owner of that abutting real estate on Blackstone Street, I would certainly be thinking and planning and organizing to redevelop it in phase. Yeah, uh, the answer to that is, like a lot of us, uh, we waited a long time for the big dig to finish. And uh, for us, uh, on our portion of Blackstone Block, we've renovated all of our buildings uh, along Union Street because that was a situation which we've known what the situation was going to be for the last 20 years, maybe, anyways, easily. And so now uh, our plan would be probably uh, to design all of this uh, at the same time, you know, so that uh, hopefully uh, the development that would take place in the Blackstone block and on parcel nine would be uh, uh, reduced to as short a period of time as possible. That, that's what our goal would be, and that's what our plan would be. Right. We don't, I, I, I can't say that we have any plans right now. But we we have pretty good constraints from the his, uh, historic as to far as what our heights and things like that are. The facades, I guess, are probably more up for grabs. Thank you, Claudio or Bob. Bob. Yeah, just three quick questions. Um, one kind of an economic question. One of the important goals of this whole effort was to improve Blackstone Street, and you obviously have referenced that. The preliminary estimates in our group is that this is a multi-million dollar venture. Um, and my question is, with the program that you have on the residential side for about half the number of units that another residential proposal has, and with a rooftop garden or a farm, it might actually cost you money. Do you have the resources within this project to underwrite the kinds of improvements that we're envisioning? And the reason I ask is because in your proposal, in your written proposal, it's a little equivocal. You say these improvements might potentially include and that we will contribute financially, but not too many specifics. So could you respond to that, Jim? Sure. Um, I would say yes, we're absolutely committed to financially, uh, and, and to, to be clear, contribute to the betterment of Blackstone Block. We weren't going to be overly specific because I think, it, in fairness, there's a lot of stakeholders um, that are involved in Blackstone. Uh, but certainly, we understand uh, the flush condition of the street and the sidewalks is of primary importance to the vendors uh, and the pedestrian experience. Uh, utility infrastructure for the pushcart vendors, electric, water, drainage, um, uh, certainly fully underwriting the trash recycling center uh, and working on with them to help, uh, I guess you could say, a cap uh, in a reasonable manner. Their expenditure out there for trash and recycling is an important component. Um, uh, I, and I think we, we have hard estimates in regard to uh, rebuilding Blackstone Block. Um, so I would say that we would be a very significant major contributor to the rebuilding uh, and augmenting those features within Blackstone. Um, and uh, and you were right, Bob, the, uh, the, the rooftop garden, the, the greenhouse, and that infrastructure does cost money. Uh, but we think that's more towards the community aspect of the project um, as well. That leads to my second question about yep. the rooftop farm. It, it, it's an interesting idea. Uh, but beyond advancing the idea and its benefits, I'm not sure it's particularly well developed in the proposal itself. And my question is, what is the alternative if it doesn't succeed? And secondly, even if it does, what is the downside of the seasonal nature of that kind of use? This is a rooftop use which is fairly visible from a lot of locations around. And I'm not a farmer and I'm not an expert on growing seasons, oh, but it's Boston. <laughs> you know, I imagine it's, it, it, it's more down than up. And I'm just wondering how you deal with that element of it, 
you know, if it doesn't succeed, or even if it doesn't succeed when it's not active in such a visible sight, it's by no means out of sight, out of mind, since it's on the lower level of the structure. Yeah. And, and that's, a, that, that's fair. Uh, Shawnee Gillis-Smith is here, who uh, could, could speak to maybe more of the, the rooftop aspect uh, by way of the greening and the, and the uses. Let, let me just suggest, though, in regard to the off-season and the visibility of the roof, I guess I would, I, I guess I'd be more mundane and say there's a lot of rooftops we all look down on, uh, on, on the buildings uh, that may be there already in their own historic nature. That might be old mechanical equipment, old roofs, uh, old dunnage, uh, parking cars at the uh, adjacent parking lot that are nothing really great to look out, out on 365 days a year. So I think taking that with a grain of salt. Uh, a rooftop garden when it goes into hibernation is perhaps certainly no worse and perhaps maybe a little bit better. But I'll speak, let Shauna speak to the more exact. I, I actually, just, just following up on one thing that I said, there's actually a lot of rooftops that we look at that we don't even realize we're looking at. For example, the central larder is a rooftop in, in itself. I think there, there's a lot of precedents of, of successful green roofs in the city, but also agricultural roofs sort of in a larger picture. <coughs> and so we don't have any question in the viability of the, of the project, but we also want to be strategic about it and, and intelligent. And so the idea is that the, the roof would have an agri uh, agricultural component. It potentially is the whole roof. It may be a smaller roof. It may be scale. The agricultural component may be scale. Um, the green roof system, the, the layers, um, the, the sort of hard kind of drainage layers that, that go down, the waterproofing layers, are the same whether it's going to be an agricultural roof or a simple sedum um, extensive green roof. And so the idea would be that we, that we would determine you know, in the development of the project the optimal amount of the agricultural roof to start off with, and the rest of the roof would be a simple sedum roof. And that the project would be expanded in, in, in association with, you know, with school groups that we're working with them, or community groups, and then you know expanded or or shrunk depending on on the um, sort of the viability and the success of it. I have just one final question. In the proposal and in your description tonight, Phil, uh, when you said what was going to happen in the Blackstone market itself. Uh, the point was made, I think, appropriately in the proposal and effectively in the proposal that this would not be competitive with Amart, and clearly that's essential. But I must say, in terms of the other elements of the district, particularly including the first floor of Parcel 7, which didn't get a lot of attention in the proposal, what you're describing for the Blackstone market sounds exactly to me what is being planned for the first floor of Parcel 7. A cooperative farmers market. No, and it's 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 quite different. Okay. Um, I think uh, if you're a farmer, it's very clear what the difference is. In parcel seven, uh, you're pulling right up. <laughs> if you're, if Assume you're, none of us are farmers. <laughs> At parcel, least on this side. Of it. <laughs> on parcel seven, the farmers are going to be selling their produce individually. Uh, and really? yes, they're going to have uh, stands. They're going to have. They have many different ways of marketing, but they they're going to be very much there and have their staff selling. Uh, on our end of things, it's going to be basically a professional operation where farmers sell into it and hopefully get a percentage of the profits out of it at the end. The answer, the and the long term answer on all of this is. Once all of us, well, obviously the people have been designated on parcel uh, seven. They they have their own plans as to what's going to be there. We have our plans. The push carts have a pretty good idea of what they're doing. We have the west side of Black Street. <laughs> <Street. We laughs> That's all, a compliment, I think. Yeah, right. Right. We are all going to get together and clarify these issues. But I can guarantee you, there's no conflict in these things. They really complement each other, and. Even when you take all of the district together, it really isn't. It is going to be big enough to meet all of the needs of the farmers and of the consumers. And so I, I think the whole district is going to be extremely successful 
and we look forward to working with all of these groups to make sure of that. Any other members of the any other members of the committee? Danny? John, just one question for Ed on the uh, three restaurant spaces yeah. and servicing them from a loading standpoint. Yep. Um, can you have a central facility that gets to all three of these at different elevations? In the yeah, no, it's again it's um, Sorry to make that clear, but I think it's uh, they're, they're all they're all loaded and serviced uh, off this off this again central core here. Um, again, that elevator not only uh, serves the push carts to the basement in terms of storage and access, but goes to the uh, second floor where all the kitchens interconnect there. So that that would be loading as well as trash and recycling for the restaurants. Last call on the committee, anybody else? Okay, I'll start on the side of the room again. Members of the public, anybody questions? Raise your hand, state who you are and where you're from. Yanni? Yanni Sippus. Uh, I'm a Township Waterfront resident, but I also happen to be on the board of the Boston Public Market Association. So um, we're just in listening mode, so it's very uh, interesting to hear sort of the way the different teams uh, refer to the Boston Public Market. I, I would just make a point of clarification. I mean, there, there would, will absolutely be some co-op component to the public market. Uh, I think it's just, a, I mean, this is the first meeting that we've really sort of heard some of these things uh, vetted, and I think this just illustrates the need for ongoing collaboration, cooperation, coordination between our own organization, and we're very fortunate to have been designated and whoever the successful designee is on, on parcel nine. And I know that between the Commonwealth and the DRA, there will be that level of coordination. Uh, but I, I do want to make that, that clarification because I think it's very important, even at the very beginning of the process, to ensure that the foundation is laid, the groundwork is laid for a successful, uh, successfully diverse market district to make sure that different components aren't cannibalizing each other, competing with each other, et cetera. Uh, so, but, but thank you very much for the, for the clarification on your end. Appreciate it. And I think Yanni's uh, comments are basically uh, similar to ours. I mean, we're we all have the same goals, and I do think that as a group of individuals, we're, we expect to work and cooperate with each other, and I think that's going to be part of the excitement in front of uh, all of these projects. So did you have your hand up in the back? Yes. Uh, no, Chantel. Uh, Group manager of the Summers Irish Pub School in Union Street. Victor, get it. Just to clarify one point: the, the marketplace itself, at present, the push cart markets operate on Friday and Saturday only. Will this marketplace be a seven-day week? Yes. Okay, will be. because that is very important at the moment. We have been working with Parcel Seven, being vacant for. Well, I only have been with the company twelve years. So. 12 years. Um, I think it's very important that we have something like this in there to bring some light back to that street. Um, we have one of the locations on it. And it's good to know that there's going to be something vibrant there for seven days a week. Okay. Others? Jeanette Herman, Deacon Hill. Uh, the RFP specifies that the ground floor market should be compatible with the, the market district planning to date and should sell fresh food at, at accessible prices. It, it echoes the PPS report that was commissioned by the BRA a few, few years ago that recommended that we, we protect hay markets, what they call vital role in the Boston food distribution system for one of the most diverse populations of any market. I'm a little confused here because it seems to me that um, what I'm seeing here is sort of echoes what, what Yanni's concerned. Um, you're saying a ground level market features local produce and food products and an extensive selection of prepared foods. And what the PPS folks recommended a few years ago was that we actually maintain a distinct identity for parcels seven and nine. Um, and I think prepared food isn't really part of that, that vision, so fresh food at accessible prices. Like can, can you help me sync your vision and the PPS vision here? Yeah. Um, well, there's a slight problem with reality and hopes. Uh, the fact of the matter is 
a large population, a large portion of the population works uh, all day long, not only males, but females. And when it comes time to, after a long day of work, coming home and preparing a meal, not everybody wants to do that. On the other hand, they do want to have good ingredients. And so part of being able to market produce comes in converting that produce into a marketable product, which is basically a finished product that you can go home and eat. Uh, and the goal would be that that product would be of the highest quality and come from locally grown produce. And so uh, I think there is a need for that, uh, and I think that that need <coughs> needs to be provided because there is a, uh, and it also uh, is an added increase in, in the price of your food. In other words, if you prepare it, you could sell it obviously for a higher price than if it's just the raw material. So I think that there is a very uh, real uh, need for that, and uh, I'm not so sure that it's a large component, but it's an important component to, to the market, yes. I appreciate the fact that you're, you're distinguishing the, the need that you feel you're going to meet from the need that PPS identified for the, the more diverse population in the city. Right. The, the other thing is, yeah, I think that's the thing. That's, <laughs> <laughs> you're telling me I answered the question. Yes, sir. Uh, Scott Lappert, uh, Chair of the Beef again. Uh, I just was wondering, where is the provisions in this plan for the raw foods? Uh, I saw the provisions for the prepared foods. But where would you put the raw foods, such as fish or cheese and yeah. meats, you know, all of the other ingredients and, and foods of the hay market yeah. that should be in the marketplace? Yeah. Go back to that. I, I didn't see where they would be. Right there. All of it is in that area called the market area. And there's also here loading storage, freezer potential here as well. That market area would have uh, yeah. enclosed buildings for, for stores, for, yep. for meats and so forth? Everything, yeah. Yep. Also back in yep. here too where it's really loading storage but also for freezers, right. coolers, freezers. etc. It's a little hard to define. Yeah, the way it, 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 yeah, it's it's hard to tell from the diagram. It doesn't look like yeah. close. It's all there. It's there. I mean, okay. the fact of the matter is, it all has to be there. Where it's going to be is obviously still up in the air. Okay, well that's good. Anybody else? How many apartments in the uh, residence building? The total of 50 units on five floors. And how many parking spaces? There is no parking spaces. Oh, brother. That's no good. Well, no. Uh, one thing that's important to realize is that the Blackstone Block is part of the North End, but it's also quite different from the North End in the sense that the Blackstone Block has three major parking lots around it. Uh, one is the one at uh, Quincy Market, one is the one that's on uh, Parcel 7, and then the, obviously the biggest one by far is uh, the Government Center parking garage. So there, there's no uh, shortage of parking available for people who want to have parking who are going to be living here, but they will have to pay for it, obviously. Why well, don't they incorporate parking in the first two floors? The building I live in has parking on the first two floors and then the rest of the residence. Well, I, think, I, I don't think parking would be very it, it's it, it, When it comes to parking, the lot itself is not a overly large lot, and I don't think it's a, a very appropriate use for those two levels. So. Um, Pete from the BRA. Sorry, Peter Gore from the BRA. Uh, Ryan Kenny already left. I just want to make it very clear. This area is not in the North End resident parking program. This is not eligible for North End resident parking at all, and that's why we went with a zero parking ratio in the site. Okay. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate that. We appreciate that, too, Peter. <laughs> Other members? Of, yes, sir? Uh, my name is Peter Thompson. I live in Big Hill, and I've lived there for 60 years, and in Boston, I raised about 70 I think it's an aspect of this. I think this is one of the most wonderful projects I've ever seen in the last 60 years. I've lost it, I've seen a lot of development. And there's an aspect of it, probably had, maybe I've overlooked, but certainly I know the farmer 
hazard. New England is becoming a farming country again. Uh, we have in the last 20 years, cheeses, wines, especially foods, that are all being grown in Vermont, New Hampshire, or Boston, uh, not Boston, but Boston itself, Massachusetts, of the Cape, everywhere. And I, I believe personally that in 50 years, New England would be almost self-sustained in, in its food. Because for one thing, California, water is going to gradually disappear out there. Yeah, we have water in the rain. And we, we're going to have people who want better, better food all the time. This will be a beacon for the rest of New England to realize that Boston is in the forefront of developing a marketplace for fine and edible and very healthy food and it would be help all over the window, not just Boston itself. That's my feeling about it. My father had a farm, he had a dairy farm, an apple farm. I still own that farm. We put that under conservation so that it will be available for people to use 100 years from now. And I think this is a wonderful thing that you're thinking of doing. I hope it goes all the way through. But it will be not just Boston, but all of New England will benefit by what, you, what you're planning to do. That's my um, I would agree with everything you say, except I would say, I'd see that happening in 25 yeah, well, years. Well, all right. <laughs> uh, I also would agree with you that uh, the farm credit people who we've been working with basically finance all the farmers. Uh, without the farm credit, farming would not exist today in New England. I mean, uh, they give us loans at 2.5%, so that gives you an indication of how important they are to farming. And they feel very strongly that if our market is successful, that with the management that is in place with that market, that could be expanded into other uh, metropolitan areas in New England with the same management team. And so, uh, just to expand on what you're saying, I think this project is extremely important to the long-term open spaces in New England and farming in New England and all of the things that you're talking about. So I totally agree with you. We're going to cut that discussion off because that's one of my speeches. Any other questions? Emilio? Uh, yes, Emilio uh, Favorito, something uh, uh, for the HPA. Uh, as Peter Gorey pointed out, because uh, I've heard several people be concerned about the absence of parking uh, and concerned, uh, but as Peter pointed out, the, the, the guidelines for the RFP specified they didn't want to see parking uh, on the site. And uh, one of our concerns is uh, parking demand because uh, um, we're very much concerned that, that, that not more demand be made on, on the parking load in that block than it can sustain. And in looking at the, the four proposals, you've got um, 50 units of housing, um, 20 units of, of housing, museum and hotel, and I think it, you've got to look at what's the relative demand likely to be generated by those four different types of uses when, you, when you're evaluating what the impact is going to have on the, the supply of parking, especially in, in the uh, parcel 7 garage, which is so critical uh, to our customer base. Any other questions from the community? Anything else from the committee? Thank you.